Very good. Good morning, then. Good morning to everyone. Welcome to the second lecture. Let's see. Um, I have a couple of things to say about uh, yesterday. Uh, the first is that I'm an idiot, so I made a mistake yesterday, which I think someone had, uh, was trying to tell me. So the with the definitions I gave, everything was uh, superficially correct, but the the definition I gave was not uh, the one I, I usually like or that everyone likes. Uh, let me try to say it uh, better today, so to correct it. So, uh, of course, so this is true. The, so the, the um, epsilon tensor transforms naively. But the point is this, if you would like it to be invariant so that it is one in all coordinate systems, then uh, well, you cannot do so because of this. So it, uh, you have a contradiction, namely if you set it to be one in one coordinate system, then it won't be one in another coordinate system. In that sense, so you can uh, then define an epsilon uh, naught, which is one in all coordinate systems, which will be invariant. However, it is not a tensor if you do that. This guy, on the other hand, is a tensor and it is not invariant. It is not, uh, it does not have the same value in all coordinate systems. So uh, yesterday I got confused at some point and I put the zero on the wrong one so that uh, then when I got asked a question about this, I, I got additionally confused. Uh, yesterday thinking about it, why, did, why the hell did I have a G here? There shouldn't be any. So in terms of this guy, which is a tensor, um, then there is no need for any square root of G. So the people sometimes use this guy, which is the, uh, uh, let me call it the naive Levi Civita, uh, but be warned uh, that it is not a tensor. And then if you raise all the indices, you have another similar formula, but uh, you can see, perhaps you can do this as an exercise that uh, at that point you have a square root of uh, G minus one. Okay, so this is the uh, correct way to say it. Uh, one more thing about yesterday's lecture, in my haste, I didn't say something important. The very last uh, step so that okay good so we introduced the uh, homology cohomology they are um, uh, sort of dual to each other uh, well but one important thing to say uh, right away would have been a minute to say it and um, I don't know. okay let me say now is that then this uh, first term class you can view it as a uh, um, as a way to assign a number, an integer number, to, uh, to all the elements of H2. Because uh, this is only defined, um, only depends on the cohomology class. Why is that? Because if you have two S2 and S2 prime, which are in the same cohomology class, then this guy is the boundary of some S3. By definition. But then by uh, this uh, Stokes uh, theorem, you have this, which is zero. So this only depends on 
on the on the homology class. In H two. So, given that this is finite dimension. As I stated yesterday, namely there are only a finite number of uh, different homology classes, for example, in H2, but also in other degrees, in other dimensions. Uh, then this is just a bunch of numbers. So this uh, C1 that I introduced is a less uh, mysterious uh, object than, uh, than you might otherwise think. Good. Actually, uh, let me, I was going to say uh, to switch topic, but now maybe I can say more about this, about homology, namely, So we remain on the same topic for, for a second. So there is a, um, in each homology, a cohomology class, there is a, a particular representative, which is uh, called the harmonic form. So a uh, harmonic form is one that is not only closed, but also co-closed. So yesterday we saw that oh, this should be different type of brackets. This So this shows, think about it, the, um, shows that it's the same as being in the um, <clears throat> in the kernel of this operator, this Laplace Deram operator, because, well, okay, one side is, one arrow is obvious because uh, delta is d, d dagger plus d dagger d. And the other, you put it like this, if uh, delta, so that, that's the, uh, the arrow going down, for the arrow going up, you just say, oh, if delta alpha is zero, uh, then you exploit this. And then you see that if this is zero, um, then of course also the alpha and the dagger alpha have to be zero. It's a sum of squares. Uh, integral of uh, sums of squares. So the, this is only zero, this is zero. Yeah. 
if the alpha and the dagger alpha are separately zero. And moreover, there is, um, you can show that there is a single, well, as I um, mentioned, there is a single representative for each homology class. So this is something called the Hodge decomposition. So how do we show this? Well, consider the eigenvalues again. Now I is not a degree, uh, but rather a label over the spectrum. And so any alpha can be expanded in this basis of eigenfunction or eigenforms of the Laplacian. And I want to define uh, operator G, which is morally the, the inverse of the Laplacian. So G stands for Green's function, Green's operator. How do I do it? Do it? Well, I somehow the eyes, but I, I sum over the eyes such that which I, there will be only one, uh, most one, sorry, uh, uh, only lambda equals zero, uh, of course, will, uh, will be excluded from, uh, from this. And Now this is a bit of a symbolic sum because the for every lambda i there may be more than one uh, alpha, and in particular for lambda equals zero there could be many, uh, which would be the harmonic forms. Uh, one point of confusion: a harmonic. Uh, so there is another. So sometimes we call a function harmonic a function. Harmonic if it's in the, uh, if it's just an eigenfunction of the Laplacian, the ordinary Laplacian, not the Laplace de Ramon Perito. But that's uh, not exactly what we are saying here because here we're, um, so if you restrict this, uh, namely if you restrict this uh, uh, definition of, Laplace, of uh, harmonic form to uh, k equals zero, to the zero forms, uh, then you will get you might say, oh, those are the harmonic functions. But unfortunately, in, in uh, other topics, we sometimes uh, say that the function is harmonic if it's just an eigenfunction of uh, the person. So the two definitions are a bit, little bit in a clash here. Okay, a slide. So as you can see, uh, then this is sort of an inverse to, to the Laplacian. But not quite. So the, the fact that I put the lambda in the denominator uh, makes sure that uh, most of the uh, of these uh, summons are reproduced, but uh, really only the ones for um, where the eigen uh, value is non-zero. But then, what is this? This is uh, really uh, the a projector, it takes away some parts. So if I define the projector on uh, harmonic forms, then this is the identity minus the projector on the harmonic forms. Because the, it's the complementary project. Uh, 
orthogonal. But now uh, we can write this. So the same equality can be written also as H alpha plus delta G alpha. In other words, we see that a form can be decomposed into a harmonic, it's a harmonic projection plus an exact form plus a co-exact form. And it's easy to see that this, uh, so this is the Hodge decomposition, I promise. So then it's easy to see that the, um, well, various things, that these, so let me write it more symbolically perhaps, how do I want to write it, that the space of all forms is, equal to the space of harmonic forms uh, in, uh, in our case that the uh, form degree as yesterday. Uh, sometimes we can write this uh, plus the space of exact forms plus the space of co-exact forms. And these are all orthogonal to each other. It's easy to see that uh, they are orthogonal. Um, if we respect to this uh, bracket, to this inner product here. That's one thing you can see. But moreover, you can see that uh, uh, with this, that the uh, harmonic uh, representative uh, uh, is unique. So in every As a consequence of this, now exists a unique harmonic representative. Well, exists just because you project a given form, and it is unique because if you um, because if you want to add, uh, so if you um, say, oh, now I have a harmonic representative. Uh, let me find another one. Well, to find another one in the same cohomology class, you would uh, add a, um, an exact piece, but that cannot be because the adding a, an exact piece to a harmonic uh, form, you're not going to find another harmonic form. Um, so yeah. I ask a question. Yeah. Um, it's uh, when you applied the Laplacian uh, on uh, G alpha. On the right hand side, uh, I don't understand where uh, the operator G ended up. Uh, on the right hand side, so the, uh, well, you see every the delta acts diagonally, right? So on each of these, what does it do? Well, on each alpha, it multiplies by lambda. Okay. So then it didn't end up. So there is some kind of moral inverse. If H, if there was no harmonic representative at all, then you could just invert G. So this is the statement that you can invert an operator on, its, uh, on the complement of its kernel. So just as to, so if it were fine, I'm, but I write it in a, such a fancy way just because it's an infinite dimensional uh, operator. Otherwise, uh, as a matrix, it's a stupid statement. If you have any operator, uh, so the part, to, so if it doesn't have a kernel, you can just invert it. If it, um, otherwise, you can invert it on the complement of, of its kernel. 
Okay. So this is so this is a generalization of uh, in the uh, the inverse. It's a, a something. Um, um, if you want, uh, if you want, there's also a fancy name, uh, uh, something called the Fred Holm uh, alternative. But, so it's just the inversion. Yeah. So the G uh, disappeared just because the, by design because it's uh, supposed to be some kind of inverse of delta. That's why I call it G, like the Green's function is an inverse of uh, of the Laplacian yeah, in uh, say in three dimensions. Mm. It is an right. Yeah, but in the line below, you wrote uh, well alpha equal to uh, the projection on the harmonic form. And the alpha, not the G. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, but never mind. Uh, okay, not this. Uh, no, I was referring to the line below where you wrote alpha equal to projection on uh, the money exactly, and then uh, on the right side you you wrote the definition of the Laplacian. So the ah, no, so thanks. The, yes, no, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. My bad. Absolutely. Okay. okay, this is not zoom, this is one note. Sometimes you just have to kill it. And restart it. Okay. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Yeah. So the uh, the statement was that this is exact and this still is. I mean, we we don't really care what's in the parentheses, but yeah. So it's yes, absolutely. We have a G here. Thank you. Thank you. In uh, homology. There is a notion of uh, intersection. So if you have two subspaces, uh, S, SK, SD minus K, I don't know, in two dimensions, you would uh, draw something like this. Uh, obviously, <laughs> this drawing is for D equal to two and K equal one. Well, so the intercept, the number of intersections uh, is not. Um, so if you just count the, the points in which they intersect, you wouldn't get a, a meaningful number because the, if I consider a different representative, of course, yes, in the, with the subspaces, but if I now consider a different representative uh, for, the, for the homology class of SK, in general, uh, it might not. So if I continuously deform this uh, this um, second guy, I might end up with this. So here I have three uh, intersections, and now I only have one. So it might look like uh, then I don't have a notion of intersection among um, two uh, homology classes. Yes, I don't I can count the number of intersections between two subfaces, but not a, it's not uh, well defined in a homology class. However, there is a way of um, uh, assigning a sign to each intersection, which uh, works like this. You take a uh, basis um, of vector fields uh, which are tangent uh, to S uh, K and to S uh, and another which is uh, um, of the vector fields uh, tangent to SD minus K in the neighborhood of the intersection point. And uh, 
sorry, the, you take over the, this basis of uh, everything and then you go at the intersection point and you check. Um, so you look at the two bases together and you compute their determinant basically. That gives you, so the sign of that determinant gives you a plus or a minus. And if you now count the number of intersections I write about this. It's a bit of an abuse of language, but uh, but so this what this means is the sigma, the sign of the of each intersection of the so um, this is a, a union of uh, many points, and uh, for each point uh, we compute the sigma. Then we sum those signs, and we will get an integer. In this situation, I don't know, that you might imagine that, so the, in this situation, the, you don't have to imagine this would be a plus, for example, this would be a minus, this would be a plus, and here this would be a plus. So you see that in the first situation, you get plus minus plus, and then the second you get plus. So the, this would be plus one in both, in both cases. And this is now well-defined in uh, the, homology class. The, uh, and it's called the intersection. Homology classes. A couple more definitions. Uh, you can show, I will uh, skip the, the proof here, that there is a, um, for each S, so this, this is a bit like the notion of um, the, the Ries theorem and uh, the theorem of, uh, the spaces. So for every SK, let me put it like this, there exists uh, something called the Poincare dual of SK, which is in the, which lives in uh, cohomology. And it's defined in such a way for every, if you take the integral of this uh, d minus k uh, form over as d minus k, we keep you. The intersection. And if you apply this twice, you find that the So have properties. So there is a. I can define a subset of forms. So so far it, uh, we defined the homology 
with the Z. But the, the way I introduced the rank homology, I didn't write any Z here. So the Z here will be those whose integers, whose uh, integrals are quantized. Uh, this one or two pi is uh, just a matter of convention. Perhaps, perhaps I don't put uh, Okay, so for example, one over two pi, we saw that, uh, sorry, that the chain class is, has this property. It is in here, in HK of MZ. The trace of F is a representative for um, an object that belongs in here. And also we see, given this, that for forms in uh, for elements of H uh, um, of H K of Z, the integral so this is the integral over n. This is a uh, d minus k form. This is a k form. So the integrate over the whole MD. And the so you see that the integral over uh, of um, of the wedge or the whole manifold of two uh, integer classes, these are called, are, has a topological meaning and it is an integer too. So this is a refinement of um, uh, the rank homology. There, is a, there are alternative definitions of, uh, of these guys, uh, of this HK and MZ. So uh, mathematicians would uh, typically have started in a different way. But then there's a Dirham theorem that I show that this uh, definition I give here, this alternative definition that I give here is equivalent. Okay, I think we all had um, enough of um, homology and I think I want to switch gears a bit now this is a part which is a bit in between the two let me call it spinos You might also see it as a part of differential geometry, but we really needed to um, get us into the next topic. Uh, we all know, I suppose we will remember, um, how spinos work in a flat space. We introduce gamma matrices, which have this uh, Clifford property. I mentioned it already. And why do we do it? Well, among the reasons, we have the fact that uh, then these guys
give a representation of the Lorentz algebra of, uh, well, I'm using uh, Greek indices now, so um, I guess I'm correct in saying Lorentz. And if I were using, Latin indices, I could say that they give a representation of the um, Lie algebra SOD. And there's a, the generators of uh, both, in both cases, the generators are of the form. Lambda slash, I will define this. And spinors are just the, um, the space, the vector space on which um, on which this uh, this representation acts. So the lambda are just a well in the uh, Euclidean signature, but they would be an anti-symmetric matrix. Otherwise, they have a property that they preserve eta. And the exponential is just this guy. You see, once again, that uh, when I have, I like putting a one half in the definition whenever I have two um, anti-symmetric indices that are contracted. Sorry if I sometimes uh, fall silent. I have uh, many topics in this uh, part of, uh, of the lectures and then switching back and forth, trying to keep track. So uh, yesterday we saw this, uh, I evoked, uh, invoked this uh, Clifford algebra at some point. And I uh, mentioned that the uh, contractions and wedges have um, Similar, formal similarity. Let me say, uh, say something more. Once again, this is perhaps not entirely uh, uh, needed, but I'll, um, I'll be fast, I promise. So you can, using the Clifford algebra, you can compute identities such as, I don't know, this. You, I can divide this into its uh, commutator plus anti-commutator in this case, and you get something like this. Continuing along this line, you can show where this gamma with many indices is just a generalization of the one with two we just saw. So you just 
take the product of uh, K gamma matrices and the antisymmetries. Okay, so generalizing this uh, simple one, uh, you compute some more and you arrive at uh, this. But now, uh, it turns out that I can give a nice interpretation of, um, of this guy. So there's some, something called the T4 map. What does it do? Well, I associate to this guy, uh, the opposite. Um, I put that in correspondence to another antisymmetric object. Which is so yesterday, which is the the X symbol. Well, under this identification, you can see that this guy behaves like a, uh, it just becomes like a DXM wedge, DXM1, and so on, DXM MK. But sub uh, behaves a bit like a wedge. Whereas this guy, um, here I have k minus one legs, so it behaves like a contraction, in fact. So generalizing this uh, notation here, the Clifford map can be denoted as follows. So remember that uh, alpha. Or something like this. And the corresponding guy here. There's an open mic and someone using a hammer. So now, uh, well, this is, so there, there's this slash notation, which is a Feynman notation, but generalized to arbitrary number of gammas. So imagine you multiply this identity here by one over k factorial times alpha m1 and k. Well, what you get in the end is that this And this K matches with the definition of contraction we had. <laughs> ah, okay. Salt. So even we can even be bolder and write something like this. Well, this is uh, to be understood with the gain of salt, what it really means is this. There's a similar uh, identity 
for uh, the right action for gamma m. Okay, here to distinct to tell the difference, I'll uh, try to do this. So the similar identity for the right action. As a minus sign here. You see, I'm trying to be careful. Um, you first take the wedge or the contraction and then the slash. To be honest, sometimes I'll uh, lose patience and I'll uh, start skipping all these slashes and I'll start confusing uh, forms with these guys. What are these guys, by the way? So these uh, products of gammas, they have two spinorial indices, if you think about it, because they act on uh, spinors. So they are matrices acting on spinors. So they are, uh, you can call them bispinors. So the Clifford map is a map from forms to bispinors. So in this, uh, let me write this one symbolically as well. And if in this uh, light, we can, so the, the fact that we mentioned yesterday that the X wedge and the Ota, the contraction form the kind of uh, Clifford algebra now acquire a new meaning because the you see that okay here I'll be a bit a bit cavalier and I'll be a bit quick but the, the Clifford algebra we had yesterday had uh, this uh, formal metric in uh, two d dimensions but you know if <laughs> I think you know that if you diagonalize this matrix you get a bunch of ones. And bunch of minus ones. So, what we are getting here, what we are seeing here is that exactly this process of diagonalization. The dx iota obey the Clifford algebra with this metric. And then this change of uh, basis here, uh, so this, um, this identities here are like a change of basis to a, a new uh, Clifford algebra, to two. So the, a new Clifford algebra, we again doubled, but uh, we now um, diagonal metric. And the, these correspond to the block with the identity, and this right action corresponds to the block with minus the identity. So this is what's uh, going on. Now this looks uh, might look like a waste of time, but this is um, well, it's, uh, useful in many uh, contexts to compute quickly uh, some identities with the gamma matrices, for example. Anyway, so it's not incredibly needed uh, this week. Maybe we'll uh, use it uh, next week if, uh, if we have time. Now, this was uh, not necessarily in uh, code space. It, uh, these are all uh, remarks that uh, you could um, make in a uh, fast space as well. So let's see what we what we can do. Um, so what, what we need to do to define spinos in uh, 
default spaces. So the issue here uh, in a nutshell is that um, in a curved space, so for, we know how to promote a, a, a vector, for example, to a vector field pretty easily. I mean, a vector field or a vector uh, on a manifold uh, transforms, instead of transforming with the, uh, with the lambda, with the Lorentz matrix, we transform uh, with the Jacobian matrix. And so on with the other tensors in the, you promote the lambdas with the, I mean, following the structure, the index, uh, the index structure that you had in, uh, say, special relativity, you promote them, uh, uh, you promote those with the, either the Jacobian or the inverse Jacobian. But spin-offs are different because they give a representation. So it's pretty easy for a vector to extend a vector to, from a SO representation to a GL representation, because after all, the Jacobian matrix is not an S in SO necessarily. But for spinos, spinos are different because they have been built to be a representation of SO only. This is how I introduce them. So how do you then make them uh, into representations um, how do you make them transform under, uh, under the Jacobian matrix? Well, that's the uh, reason for the seemingly Baroque uh, formalism that I'm uh, going to, to introduce. So first of all, the natural thing is now, so earlier this, G in the Clifford algebra could be just uh, eta for the, it's just a symbol for eta in a um, Lorentzian signature or just the identity in a Euclidean signature. But now uh, this should be now the curved matrix, the, the curved uh, ma matrix. And is there an effective way of finding uh, some gammas that uh, satisfy this? So the, I didn't say it, I think you know that there is a whole theory of uh, representations of uh, the original one here. So in particular for dimensions, you know the, uh, exactly how to find the basis. In any dimension, you know that, that uh, there are either two or one representation depending whether the dimension is odd or even. But now what do we do in a, a court uh, space? Do we have to start with the, um, restart the, represent, the representation theory? Well, no, uh, there's a trick. You introduce a basis, an orthonormal basis called the field bind. Uh, A fancy name for the normal basis. I put it, I put off the normal basis in parentheses because you should be understood with the gain of salt. If, uh, in, uh, you introduce a, so a new index A that runs over the uh, elements of the basis. And basis of what? In this case, you see that these are all components of a form. An orthonormal just means, sorry, it means something else. Right here, GAB, but this just means uh, delta in the orthogonal case, or yes, I can put the delta here since I'm using 
um, Latin indices. Uh, for now, I'll just put a G here and uh, repeat the, um, all the identity, uh, write all the identities in the orthogonal uh, case in uh, Euclidean signature. So, as a consequence, you also have this. Sometimes in the Euclidean case, I don't bother um, lowering one of the two indices. I might um, have them both up sometimes. Good. Um, so uh, this is called feel bind, but sometimes you'll see fear bind with an R if you are working in four dimensions. So the trick, why is this trick useful? Well, because now uh, these, if these obey the flat space. Default algebra, then this will be satisfied automatically. As you can check by multiplying this identity by uh, EAM, EBN. Now, the funny thing is, however, that uh, we introduced the uh, new spurious uh, object. So, okay, now uh, with this trick, we uh, basically have already introduced Venus in cold space because the, well, the, they are now the vector space on which this gamma a are acting. But the potential problem is that the, they depend on your choice of this basis of this field bind. Well, indeed they do. Uh, so because what happens if you uh, now decide to change, there are many. Uh, You can uh, introduce a new E prime, for example. And so the gammas will change if you change this, um, if you change this uh, basis. Now, we, in theory, we might even ignore this, but that, then in that, so consistency with the, with other things that we want to do makes us feel funny because, for example, at some point we will, uh, soon we will introduce objects like this. So say that this is a spinner, eta. And this is its uh, uh, dagger, so namely conjugation, uh, in this case, just conjugation followed by transposition. And now this guy doesn't have any spin or indices anymore. They are all contracted. So I would like for, when I change this, uh, uh, field band, the gamma changes. And so if I don't do anything to lambda, uh, to the eta, to the spinner, I will get that this um, depends on the basis I have chosen. So if I want this 
to be independent of the choice of feedback. Well, then I need to say that this uh, is comes together to a change of spino. Where lambda is the exponential of small lambda. So make no mistake, this lambda is a uh, d by d matrix. It's called the local octagonal or local Lorentz transformation, depending on the signature. This exponential is an exponential of d by d matrices. And then here I have built lambda slash, which is now no longer d by d, but uh, the, you need to look at the representation of uh, gamma matrices, the dimensional gamma matrices. This uh, coincides with d only for d equal four, otherwise uh, for d equal six, the dimensional gamma matrices will be eight, for example, it progresses exponentially. And so it's a completely different matrix. Yeah, after all, it needs to act on the, on the spin -off. So it's a spin -off representation of, uh, of lambda in the same sense that we saw in the previous part in the plus in the plus phase discussion. So a spin -off very much depends in a court space very much depends on your choice of feedback. Superficially, then it doesn't really transform under coordinate changes. Uh, so this would deserve a longer discussion. Um, but let's just say, even if it does not, uh, it does transform under the under your choice of field band. The reason I say superficial is that the field band itself sometimes needs to be changed in going from one chart to another. So the two things are kind of tied together. But if you work, for example, in a single patch uh, and change coordinates, you wouldn't necessarily need to change eta. What you, uh, but if you, uh, for some reason, you need to change field bind, then you, know, you need to transform eta. Incidentally, this um, Having introduced this field by this autonomous uh, basis, we can see uh, uh, that some things are more natural than we. Uh, so, for example, the Hodge dual that I, on which I did the mistake yesterday, uh, gets a little easier. I, I think it, so. Even computationally speaking, not just com uh, conceptually. First of all, the epsilon tensor. Can be written in terms of the epsilon tensor in flat space. And now, using the same formula with the, uh, involving the determinant, so you can see that this is just a determinant of V e times the the naive Levitivita tense. But this guy, but if you look at the definition here, you'll see that the, or even at this end, even better, this identity, you see that the determinant of G is equal to the, the, the determinant of E squared. You can think of this uh, symbolically as uh, G being uh, E uh, times uh, 
in transfers. This reproduces the identity we talked about earlier. Even the star um, is a little more natural, so I don't want to repeat the, uh, so the, the identity, but now uh, the epsilon, so the identity remains the same as we know, but the, uh, the epsilon, what well, that second? The epsilon you use there. is now the flat space action. So I usually find it uh, a little easier. To actually go first to the field bind and then compute the star directly there. So even conceptually speaking, uh, uh, I mean, it's uh, way easier. So it just means that, I don't know, so uh, star of E1, E2 in four dimensions is just uh, E3, E4, and so on. Now uh, we know our NABLA and we know its action on, on any uh, one forms. What is the action of, on these one forms? Well, I can give it a name. Because after all, uh, the E's are a basis. So I can expand this, which is a one form, on um, so. I realized here that I, I, I probably understood, but let me be explicit. Any time I write a one form without an index, of course, what I mean is just like in the so it, it's implicit because this is what we introduced last time that I should have said so now this is a one form and taking the number of this one form and uh, I should get a one form and I'm free to expand it in the basis that I just introduced of one forms themselves and by definition I say that I call the coefficients uh, omega a, b, m. It's the definition of, of the omegas. They are not uh, independent in your objects because uh, I, in theory, I know what NABLA is on, every, uh, on, any, on any one form. And by consistency, in fact, with the with what I know already, so in other words, you can imagine. Um, yeah, well, you compare with the usual uh, definition, usual definition with the uh, gamma, and then by consistency with that. Well, so we know what the, what the usual definition looks like. So this becomes this. I 
I can also anti symmetrize in MNN and in form notation. Because if I anti symmetrize this, uh, this becomes a D of something over one form. The symmetrizing here, this disappears. And this becomes a wedge product. And this is called structural equation. Now, given this, it's uh, easy to see that under local Lorentz transformation, this guy needs to transform as well. This is similar to uh, the fact that, of course, under uh, diffeomorphisms, the gammas uh, to transform. Uh, now, it would be good to. Uh, Compute this and uh, carefully. I'm tempted to do it, but uh, I'll uh, show you. I'll just give you the bare bones of the um, of the derivation of a semi identity on on D of omega itself. So basically, once again, you need to use uh, this identity for the so the identity that we saw yesterday on the commutator of two nablas, and you can act uh, so acting on these uh, one forms, you get the. An identity, so you get something on the derivatives of the of the omegas. Not saying it well. So th this acting on a one form in uh, originally, let's say, so they gave you the Riemann tensor, of course, because that it contained the derivatives of the gammas. It, it was a way to define it, but now we gave another identity on nabla acting on one forms, and we can play with that and so. As well. So, uh, in that language, you get another. So, playing with that, you get another uh, identity involving the Riemann tensor. What does this RAB mean? It's this guy. So this is indeed Riemann. It's a two form associated to it. So this guy is a matrix of two forms, which is a good way of, uh, see, of uh, seeing um, Riemann anyway. The gamma has been introduced to compute the um, computer um, covariant derivatives of uh, vectors and one forms. Now, using omega, we can define covariant derivative of uh, spinos. The idea is the same as for vectors. So th this, so a partial derivative of spinos is not okay because it depends, uh, so it doesn't transform well under local Lorentz transformations. So if eta I mean, if, so we saw that eta needs to transform under local Lorentz transformation. 
but uh, the derivative wouldn't transform well. So for the same reason, then we need to introduce a covariant derivative. And omega transforms, I mentioned that it transforms on the local Lorentz and it does just so, just in the right way, so that, that is, does transform well on the local Lorentz. Now, uh, with Spinos, these are general things about Spinos that you can find in many books. Now we get to uh, aspects which are more specific to our applications. Namely, we get to the idea of G-structure. What is a... Uh, G structure. So the, the idea, so we saw that the transition functions uh, in general uh, so that are valued in something called the group, um, the structure group. But sometimes you can. Alpha beta of, uh, of some uh, bundle will be valued in some G. But the, so there is an option that we didn't use last time, which is uh, that in using this gluing and defining this gluing uh, that defines the bundle, well, we have the option of uh, changing also what the F is, acting on the F. So, it's natural to call this a local gauge transformation. It's a, like a gauge transformation that you perform in every patch. And then this, this transform as follows. So maybe you uh, naively, at first you had uh, a T alpha beta that were valued in G, but perhaps uh, by sometimes by playing with this uh, gauge transformation of the transition functions, you can make them simpler. And if you, can make them belong to a uh, to an H a subgroup of G. Um, we say that you have reduced the structural group. And the structure is a reduction of the structural group.
So for example, already the metric um, tells us uh, So for the, what is the structure group of uh, TM? Structure group of TM would be GL D of R. But we saw just a minute ago that uh, we can choose a normal basis. And you can do so in every patch. Now, if you compare the, the field binary on two patches, you can do so with the local Lorentz transformation or local orthogonal. And these uh, would be matrices in uh, OD. So already they give a reduction of D. Now, it's easy to show that on any manifold, you can put a, I mean, if you are not perverse about your definition of manifold, the way we, there's something called paracompactness, it's uh, more or less always uh, true, but uh, so, and there are very mild topological conditions, uh, magic always exists on a manifold. So the a reduction to OD always exists. But we are interested in cases where um, there are well, further reductions to smaller subgroups. So, for example, uh, this is a case that we won't use much, but uh, uh, already the existence of a vector field all over. So the, as you can see from the metric, uh, the concept of G structure is tied to the existence all over the manifold of some tensor. So for a vector field, what would happen? Um, well, so then for a vector field, you, you can say, ah, I'll um, take this uh, vector field to be, oh, maybe one from metric. So let me introduce a notation here. I forgot to do so. Uh, this is a basis of one forms. We are going to call uh, like this the basis of orthonormal basis of uh, vectors, vector fields, and I want to take them dual in this sense. Some people uh, call the two with the two symbol even. So once I have a, uh, this vector field, by normalizing it, I can say that, uh, so I suppose this vector field has no zeros. Then by normalizing it, I can I can make it uh, to so have norm one, and it could be the first object, the first element of the orthonormal basis. But then this lambda here would have to preserve it. So in every patch, if suppose I do this in every patch, then the lambda alpha beta. The one uh, in the patch alpha, this would be this vector, but also in the patch beta. So, in other words, in every patch, I I make the feedback. I make this um, basis of uh, forms. Uh, I choose it so that uh, this vector is the first. Then this lambda needs to preserve it. But so now the OD 
uh, the structural group is reduced to further to OD minus one. In other words, your transition functions now need to, uh, they have a constraint, they need to preserve something. So this is a general pattern. We are interested in a case where the structural group is reduced by eta, a spin -off. This reduces the structural group to what? To a group that I call the stabilizer. Of eta. These are the elements for D such that G on eta is eta. We can compute this, for example, specific, specific. Let's take D equals six. This will be important for us because there will be the dimension of the import of the in, uh, internal space for um, for type two. I'll introduce a basis for gamma matrices. I'll first compute this um, stabilizer. In, uh, so I want to compute the stabilizer for spin or um, eta. And for example, let's take eta to be chiral. Take a little plus. I can uh, I can just as well compute it in plus space. I can imagine that I'm uh, computing the action of the gamma AB, which uh, behave as if they were in a plus space. So probably you're familiar with this. Uh, so I need to. I want to introduce a basis to this, this uh, explicitly. Instead of considering, so first in uh, d equal to. Um, I can go to complex indices. And in uh, complex indices, in uh, holomorphic indices, the G, Z, G is such that GZZ Z is zero, same as GZ bar, GZ bar. And GZZ Z bar is one half. And now this should be one. Will just be the identity. So then we um, we can write gamma z to be of this form. Gamma Z bar to build this form. And they and they do what they should. You can think of this as uh, so if you introduce a vector a state plus 
the state minus which are um, with the first component non zero or the second, then it's natural to think that the gamma z is, uh, you can see that uh, it lowers, <laughs> so it maps one zero into zero one. So it's a uh, annihilator, so to speak. And uh, vice versa, gamma z bar is a creator. These are familiar, of course, from the from other contexts in quantum mechanics. And now in D equals six, you can take a basis where you go to, you have gamma zi and gamma zi bars, and the gamma zi uh, can be taken to be tensor products. I'm sure that, so probably many of you have seen this. Um, this is so they, your space of spinos will be a tensor product of uh, three copies now, because there are three holomorphic coordinates. And the first, for example, uh, would act. So let's call this, let's define this B. This is B dagger. This acts as uh, B on the first object and uh, identity on the second and third. And then you might say, oh, okay, I'll, uh, my second one will be acting on the, on the second uh, uh, factor and not on the first, first and third. But that wouldn't be right because the, uh, like this, this and this don't anti-commute, which I have to do. This, once again, GZ, GZI, ZJ is zero. So you need to put here something that anti-commutes. Uh, with this speed. And then gamma Z3. Similarly. So now in this basis, it becomes easy to compute uh, an anti, so the, for example, the stabilizer of the particular spinner like this. What does it consist of? So, the, first of all, let me compute the Lie algebra. Okay, so I'll write a little less. So then the, what are the, sorry, the infinitesimal, this is the infinitesimal action. So now I have to look for, what's the infinitesimal analog of this. So if imagine that G is the exponential of something, then in order for this to be true, that something needs to act with the zero. So this lambda slash on eta should give zero. 
Вот Арбиз. Well, it's easy to see that uh, any so the, these creators don't do anything because they so they give zero just because they um, these are already up. All of this gamma z bar on one zero gives zero. This is of course. So those are all um, fine, but the way it's uh, gamma zi, I just call it gamma i from now on. So the, the gamma i bar j bar, uh, for, for sure, annihilate. And there is more because they, you also have the possibility of doing this if you uh, act with the gamma ij bar. Very often you, uh, you do get zero because they, you'll have, for example, if you have gamma one three bar, well, uh, the three bar already annihilates uh, eta plus. So even if you have gamma one, uh, then it doesn't change that. But if you have gamma 3, 3 bar, that's the gamma 3, 3 bar minus gamma 3 bar 3, gamma 3, and gamma 3 uh, does not. So among the uh, annihilated, so uh, the refinement is the statement that uh, you have to subtract the trace. So this is the set of, this is not an anti-commutator, what I mean here is the set of. So perhaps I can write it in this span. So the, we can write it perhaps in a, a more, Intrinsic way. We can namely introduce um, well, perhaps I can be a little less pedantic and say that these are the lambdas. So the lambda slash where lambda has the following property. Now, I was a complex index, uh, holomorphic index, goes one, one to three. M as usual. Is a real index as we and now I introduce a tensor omega or a form omega which Is the property that when you write it out in uh, complex coordinates, it becomes like this. Then this will, uh, um, so if you write this, this will exactly uh, make sure that this is true. And the other property here, ensure by introducing another object
which when you write it out in a complex uh, indices, becomes like this. So this is the stabilizer. Now, statements. You can show it's an algebraic fact. It's uh, not true in any dimension, but in low dimension, uh, up to six actually, or spin-offs. Chiral spin off. Can be rotated to this plus plus plus. So the stabilizer of it a plus. Is this uh, is always the same? Now, what is this group here? What is this Lie algebra? Well. The fact uh, that this is true uh, basically just means that the, uh, the action, the non spinorial action of, uh, of J. So the, now you can view this as an ordinary lambda that acts on uh, tensors, uh, just two indices. So I can investigate what, the, what these properties uh, mean when they act on tensors. And uh, this is equivalent to the property that uh, the action of lambda doesn't mix uh, Z with the bar. So by itself, this would define the group of uh, unitary matrices. It's, uh, this group is isomorphic to the group of uh, unitary matrices because they become matrices that only mix uh, uh, the three coordinates, the three Z coordinates. And this guy, uh, well, this means that the In fact, this is S. We're going to see this over and over in uh, different ways. If you don't like, the, so that I'm aware that I went a bit fast with this uh, this argument here, but. Uh, Next time it will become, uh, we will see it in other versions. I only have 10 minutes. So, let's see what I can tell you. Well, this is an example of a G structure. So, the, we find that. Uh, Caraspino in D equals six defines an S3 structure. But that's just the, so that's important for physics because it defines, um, so that because a spino um, will appear in physics as the infinitesimal parameter for, uh, for supersymmetry. But in physics, we will also have derivatives on uh, uh, acting on, uh, on spinos. 
So what do we do with those? So for example, if we compute this, what do we, so what do we expect to get? In general, this would be non-zero, but it's, uh, uh, the way it is non-zero, can be parameterized. Because, um, well, you see, this plus plus plus, and the, I can build from this a uh, basis of, uh, of uh, Caraspinos. How? Well, minus minus plus, for example will be one such guy. How do I attain this? Well, I can obtain it as, uh, as the creator, gamma z3 bar from minus, minus, minus. Now it turns out that uh, this is the Majorana conjugate of the Spino. usually call it a minus. So you see then that associated to eta plus, there's a basis of all possible, because now there's plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, plus, and that's it. In six dimensions, there are only four Caraspinos. And the basis is gamma plus and uh, gamma i bar eta minus. Now, uh, the gamma i lower gamma i eta, min, uh, eta minus is zero because the if eta minus is this, then uh, uh, the lower gamma i are the annihilators and they annihilate minus, minus, minus. So if I write, instead of gamma i bar eta uh, minus, I just write gamma m eta minus, I'm just being a little redundant. So using this, I claim that I can now expand this in a basis. So this is a spinner, I can expand it in a basis. And I get a bunch of coefficients here. I call PM the coefficients uh, um, on uh, eta plus itself, and then QMM the coefficients on the gamma eta minus. Okay, but you might say, well, I haven't done much here because the, all I have done is parameterized the, the, uh, the amount uh, of uh, non-covariant constantness of the spin -off. But this is useful because it allows us to compare with the uh, derivatives of uh, other objects associated to, to eta, and namely this omega and j. To eta plus, we can associate this J and eta, which are uh, just uh, identified by its uh, stabilizer, but there's a more practical way to find, it, find them. And they coincide with the one I have given before. Mm. 
Name di? Name to this time like this. Remember, so the, um, here there are two gamma matrices, so they don't change color. It makes sense to take the uh, bilinear with theta plus itself on the other side, but here there are three, so it uh, makes sense to take the bilinear with theta minus. Remember, we can keep this in mind as a uh, kind of uh, easy example in flat space. And in flat space, then Remember this computation here was in plus space. In plus space, Omega and J had this uh, expression. In curved space, this is no longer going to be the case. And in particular, as we will see, it's not even true that we can, uh, uh, in general, so not even for a given choice of coordinates, uh, often uh, you can write them like this. I will comment on this uh, uh, next lecture. But you can still view them uh, as a local model in the sense that uh, so that can be a holomorphic field by it at least. Okay, for the, for example, H one is E one plus I E four. And this would be similar to how in flat space you write uh, that dz1 is dx1 plus i dx4, for example. And then it would be possible to write h1 uh, omega is h1 with h2 with h3 and j. As i over 2 sum of h i which um, better for them a h a bar and next time we will see I believe my time is up so since j and omega can be written as bilinears of uh, eta, you can in principle compute nabla p of jmn, for example, in the following way. There's a Leibniz identity like this, which I'm going to leave you as an exercise. Now, following this, you can then uh, keep going and uh, put this in, in surface identity. And remember that the uh, DJ can be also computed with NABLA. So the component PMN is actually just Okay. 
So if, I have, if I'm able to compute this NABLA, then I can compute this GJ. And likewise, I can compute this, uh, uh, I can compute the omega. So an important uh, consequence is that this establishes a map between NABLA eta and dj and, and the omega i spare you the details but if you the end result here is that so not only if you do this um, explicitly in the end you get that you can not only compute uh, dj and the omega from nabla pieta but also back go backwards this is the non trivial result why is it non trivial because here i'm stating that uh, there's no information if i consider both of dj and the omega there's no information lost namely i can reconstruct the whole nabla eta or if you want these coefficients the m into m from dj and the omega alone they anti-symmetrized derivatives not the i don't need if i were to consider uh, um, if i were to ignore the omega for example then i would need the whole nabla j but if I consider both dj and the omega, the anti symmetrized guys, then I can actually reconstruct the whole uh, covariant derivative of the scheme. These are called intrinsic torsion. The reason for this, uh, so this, in my opinion, for us, at least for physicists, uh, uh, this name is completely stupid. Sorry, if I say it frankly. Um, we don't, we just don't view it this way. I mean, with the, uh, the fact that it is a torsion of, it is a torsion of some other connection. Okay, so this is the reason it's called like that. And in that context, it's a good name, of course. But for us, well, <laughs> I, I, it doesn't play any role that it's a uh, torsion. So I will not explain why it is called uh, like this. But the only thing you need to know about it is that there's a computation such that it can go back and forth between these two. And well, since I'm here, I can, right, at least I can, I can conclude this uh, lecture, introducing the next, finally, where I say that in particular, nabla eta is zero. As a result of this map, nabla eta is zero if and only if dj and the omega are zero. Implicit in this, there is the fact that j and omega can be obtained as a bilinear from a spino. And those can also be summarized. Uh, so with some algebraic, uh, without uh, necessarily invoking eta. So the, the SC3 structure can be completely reformulated in terms of J and omega, and the, the covariant constants can be completely reformulated by this. This is called a manifold on which either this or this is valid, it's called the Calabria. And this will uh, be a topic for the next lecture. Finally, we got to the definition.